Now we'll talk about how do masks work, because this has been a critical question with the current coronavirus circulating. There are two main types of masks. There's a surgical mask shown on the left and then a respirator shown on the right. The surgical mask is really just intended to keep the person who's wearing it from spraying droplets onto other people. So it tends to have gaps on the sides. Um, basically, it's a physical barrier to block those, those droplets. Um, but as we saw, the mask doesn't really help with control of the fine aerosols from the person who's wearing it. It is not intended to protect the person who's wearing it from inhaling small particles because those can easily come in ar around the sides. A respirator has a tight fit and it is, or ideally has a tight fit, and it is intended to reduce the wearer's exposure to inhaled particles. And so it, with that tight fit, all the air has to go through that white part that you see on the respirator, which is some kind of fiber filter that's very efficient at removing particles of all sizes. But public health message here, for that to be effective, it has to fit well. So you've got to put it on correctly with the, uh, the if it has that kind of metal strip across it, that goes over your nose and you bend that to fit against your nose. There must be no gaps. You can see that there's uh, on the right hand side, they show incorrect ways to wear it with it upside down, or maybe the straps are crossed in the back, or maybe it's not even on. I can't tell you how many pictures I've seen of people with masks that are, you know, tuck beneath their nose or hanging off their chin while the mask isn't doing anything to protect you. It's like riding your bike and having your helmet hanging off your handlebar rather than on your head. There are three different ways that um, masks or filters are able to remove particles. And it's not mainly by sieving, so when you, or straining. So when you cook pasta, you pour it through a strainer and the pasta is too big to fit through the holes. That is not how filters work with, with particles. So the first way that, particle, that um, particles can be removed is by inertial impaction. And that's shown by the white circle. So that white circle is a particle and it's coming along. We have streamlines here flowing, the air flowing around our fiber. So that fiber is the collector outlined in blue. We're looking at it kind of end on and the streamlines have to go around that fiber. And you can see that for kind of a relatively large particle, as the streamline starts to bend going around here to go around the collector, that the particle has too much inertia and keeps going in a straight line. So this is, you know, the car's going around the corner and you get thrown against the door because your body wants to keep going in a straight line. And then it crashes into the collector or the fiber and uh, gets stuck there. The second way that particles can be removed by filters is through interception. We have a particle here shown in black. It's coming along. It does follow the streamline, but that streamline passes close enough to the collector, to the fiber, that the particle ends up bumping into the fiber and then gets stuck. And then finally, we have diffusion, where very small particles um, undergo random motion, we call Brownian motion, almost like molecular diffusion, and it's due to them being small enough that the bombardment of diffusing gas molecules makes them uh, have some random motion too. And so those can actually move out of the streamlines, wiggle through random motion, and then bump into the collector. So if we look at the efficiency, removal efficiency of each of these mechanisms, we can then come up with the total removal efficiency by the filter or the mask. And we'll focus first on impaction. That's where the particles come out of the streamlines and crash into the fiber. This shows collection efficiency on the y-axis. So it's very low for small particles. But as we get to larger particles, you can see that the collection efficiency um, increases. This is for a specific type of filter. But once we're looking at particles larger than one micron, then the collection efficiency is near 100%. Um, the curve is similar for interception. That's when the particle follows the streamlines but bumps into the, fi the fiber. So bigger particles, of course, are more likely to bump into the fiber. Diffusion has a completely opposite uh, efficiency curve where the removal efficiency is very high for these small particles around 0 0.01 to maybe 0 0.02-ish um, microns because they diffuse so much more. So they just wander around um, very far and they can bump into those streamlines. As you get to larger particles, they diffuse less um, and so they're less likely to bump into the fibers. So if we add these, oh and I should mention sedimentation is removal by uh, gravitational settling, so that's really only effective for the, the much larger particles. But if we add these all together, you can see that we have a, uh, 
a total curve where we see the minimum somewhere between 0.1 to 0.3 microns. And that's because there's, there's really no collection mechanism that works well in this region. And this is why they tend to test, res they test respirators like an N95 or an N99, they challenge it or ex try to, they, they generate aerosols that are 0.3 microns in size. And then they see how much is, is removed by the respirator. So an N95 removes 95% of those at three microns and N99 removes 99% of those. It doesn't mean that particles that are smaller are getting through. In fact, the particles that are smaller than 0.3 microns over here actually have better total efficiency. So the first two points here um, summarize what I mentioned. And then I should also mention that the capture efficiency or removal efficiency depends on the size and the density of the particle. And it should be the same whether the particle contains a virus or not. I've gotten the question of, well, if it filters out particulate matter, like just chemical stuff, will it also filter out viruses? So if we're talking about the same size particle and same density particle, then the, the mass should work the same way. There have been some studies on looking at the effect, efficacy of, of masks you know, for transmission of diseases, especially for flu virus. And this study looked at uh, several different types of masks and transmission. And what they found is that um, kind of this y-axis here shows the, the log reduction factor of how much, actually this one did not focus on transmission where the person was getting diseases. They were actually just looking at the amount of flu virus that was measured behind the mask versus in front of the mask. And you can see that the, uh, the amount the amount of reduction was kind of between, maybe around a factor of 10, if you look at the average across all these. And so you can see, that in summary, the different types of surgical masks reduced the amount of infectious flu virus that was measured behind the mask, and it was put on a mannequin, by an average of a factor of six. So that sounds great, but what we found in studies uh, of people using surgical masks in real life is that there's a, um, they don't always wear them. You know, I showed you the picture of people wearing them hanging off of their chin. Um, and so in real life, there's so many other factors that, that come into play that even though we have these mechanistic reasons to think about why the mask should work, in real life, there's, there's other things that, that get in the way. Lastly, what do we know about SARS coronavirus 2 and droplets and aerosols? Um, uh, here, this I want to compare the flu virus versus the corona, SARS coronavirus 2. Those are in the, the first two viruses shown. And we talked about the basic reproductive number. Um, we know that those two viruses are similar in size. The case fatality rate, of course, is much higher for the current coronavirus. This is a little bit old. I think the real number is probably somewhere around 1%. And it has this long incubation time, and we know now that people who don't have symptoms can start shedding virus, which makes it um, hard, hard to prevent transmission. This is a study in a hospital in Singapore. They looked at three different patients' rooms, and they collected samples from the surface and in the air in these rooms. And for patients A and B, as shown in the lower left-hand text box, the samples were all negative. They didn't detect any virus after cleaning. The results that are shown here are for patient C before cleaning. And they detected virus, so they had positive results on many of these locations. I think it was a, close to 80 to 90% of the places they, they, they collected samples, including the table, the bed rail, the locker, the chair, light switches, stethoscope, sink, floor, window, door, etc. They also notably found it on the air outlet fan, which is location 15. I assume it's somewhere up, up closer to the ceiling. Some samples were also negative, including the control panel on the bed, the call bell, the rail in the bathroom. Um, and notably, the air sample that they collected was also negative. So how can the virus have deposited on the air outlet fan, presuming nobody touched it, um, but not be detected in air? If there's challenges to detecting viruses in air. You have to get a large enough sample. If the patient was lying here with their head on the pillow and they're releasing virus, there's a thermal plume from the body that's going to carry the, tend to carry that upward. And then if the air outlet fans are right here, so this is well designed, then that virus is gonna be removed through the, the air outlet fans. So unless you were sampling right here, um, I think you'd be less likely to collect uh, positive samples. 
And then if we have these, the study of uh, size, just where they measured the actual size of virus. And again, these are all, all using molecular techniques or detecting virus by PCR. So we know that the virus, the viral RNA is there. We don't know whether the virus is infectious or not. But this was in a hospital in Wuhan and they measured virus in air as a function of size, which is really important for determining where the virus goes. And you can see that in this protective apparel room, they found concentrations up to 40 genome copies of the virus per cubic meter of air in the size range of 0.25 to 0.5 microns. These are particles that are gonna stay suspended in air for hours. And then if you look over at this other protective apparel room, the, the y-axis numbers here are lower, but again, there's still plenty of virus in, this, in these kind of submicron up to two, even up to two and a half microns where those can stay suspended in air for quite a while. And they also saw that in the medical staff office. They, I should mention, they, did, they don't have a figure for it, but they did detect virus in the air in crowded areas near the hospital entrance and near the entrance of a department store. I think the highest levels they found were 11 copies of virus per cubic meter of air. So if you stood there and breathed that air for about 15 minutes, you would end up inhaling one virus. And then there was a study, a laboratory study of whether the virus can actually survive in aerosols. Uh, and what they found is that the, the current coronavirus has a half-life of about, of about one hour, similar to that of the original corona, SARS coronavirus one, uh, meaning that for viruses that are present in air, about half of them would decay away and no longer be infectious after an hour. And then you can see also some of their results for survival on surfaces. They applied droplets of the, of the virus suspension to these surfaces, let them dried out, and then see, saw, looked at how long the virus lasted on those. And it, it lasted longer even on cardboard, stainless, and plastic, and not very long on copper, which is known to be antimicrobial. Here are the major unknowns. Um, which transmission route is dominant? And this is key for trying to control the spread. Is it direct contact? Is it indirect contact with contaminated objects? Is it inhalation of aerosols? Is it deposition of droplets? We have studied this question for decades for flu with millions and millions of dollars and we still don't have the answer. Part of it, I think, is that, um, you know, they talk about transmission at at close range or in close contact, when you're in close contact, most of the, all of these, these mechanisms, these roots can be at play. So you can shake hands at close contact, you can touch objects at close contact, you can inhale aerosols released by the, the infected person at, at close range, and that person can uh, spray droplets onto you. Uh, the second question is how are viruses actually inactivated on air, in air and on surfaces? Uh, we still don't, understand that and that would help us better be able to predict how long they can last. Uh, for the current coronavirus, we don't know how much virus is released and in what size aerosols at different stages of infection. And then although there's been a laboratory study uh, that was under one condition, 65% relative humidity of virus in its culture medium, and so we do not know how well this virus survives in aerosols under real world conditions. Finally, I'd like to thank my collaborators and all the students and postdocs who have worked on this over the past 10 or more years, um, and also the funding agencies who have supported this work. Thank you.